is amazing and we're so excited to have him here to talk with Kevin Warren, who is currently the Big Ten Commissioner. And so Kevin also was the COO of the Vikings and we have current Vikings employees over here. We're so proud to have him on the stage to represent us and Big Ten. And he gave so many of us our start in the sports industry, myself included as, um, and as an attorney. So give them a warm welcome and I'll let you all take it away. All right, thank you, thank you. So I'm, I'm honored to do this and I, I should start off saying we are, uh, when we use the word old, we are old, old friends. Um, at least 30 years and you know, part of, part of what we want to convey is, is we are two regular brothers that have been on a journey, um, rarely at the same place, but always in, in touch with each other. And what we want to do today is, is, you know, the title of this thing is The State of College Sports. We certainly want to talk about that, but we want to give you some insight on uh, Kevin's journey and, and how he got where he is. And we'll kind of blend that in with the, the state of college sports uh, as well. Um, but Kevin, you, you know, so you, you have you know, a number of firsts, which is something you, we're old enough to have first. Uh, the idea of being uh, the highest ranking black man in the NFL, uh, the idea of being the first black commissioner of a, a Power Five conference. I know you guys don't use that phrase. <laughs> but, you know, why don't, why don't you take us back to the beginning, not so much you know your 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 career in the beginning, but what college sports used to be, and what college sports was like. And I think it'll be helpful for everybody to understand this for for some of the struggles that some folks go through in grabbing on to this transition with NIL and transfer portal and the like. But but why don't you do that to give give some insight on where college sports was, and then we'll talk about where where we are. Yeah, uh, Ken. Again, it's good to see you. Before we get started, I just would like to. Uh, congratulate and also um, really thank Ken for for being a mentor of mine and and uh, still on his journey for an unbelievable career what what he did at Stanford what he did in the law practice in, in LA what he did at the University of Pennsylvania at Wharton School what he did at Arizona State and what he's still doing is really amazing I mean this is a uh, uh, a person when you start talking about on the R Mount Rushmore of college athletics and, and, and black leadership is Ken Shropshire. So Ken, I just want to thank you for what you, you have meant to me. This is living history. And then also I just want to wish uh, every dad in here uh, who's a father, happy Father's Day tomorrow and every mom in here uh, who's been a father also. Happy Father's Day to everyone here. I know it's uh, it's so important uh, being a father and a mother, but especially this weekend of, of uh, us uh, uh, thanking those individuals who've had such an impact on our lives. So, you know, Ken, the journey of, of, of college athletics uh, has been interest, interesting. I know for me and my family, my dad was a student athlete in the 1940s at Arizona State. Uh, my brother was a student athlete in the 1960s at Stanford. Uh, I was a student athlete in the 80s uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, then at Grand Canyon University. And then my son is a student athlete uh, now in Michigan State. So, you know, sports has run through my family. My daughter was a student athlete at Occidental. So since the 1940s all the way currently, sports has had a very important role in my family. I wouldn't be sitting here today, you know, w without the importance of sport and sports and college athletics, uh, because I remember Having an older brother, like I said, who went to Stanford in the 60s, He's, he was a, a first black scholarship football player to be recruited at Stanford. So growing up and thinking about it and setting a goal to play in college is what really charged me to do well academically and drove me to go to college and on beyond. So I'm a big believer in sport. I'm a big believer in all of the accoutrements that are around sports and all of you all that are here today. And, uh, and it's an honor and a blessing every single day to be able to work in this industry. And, and Kevin, what's, and, and thanks for those kind words, it's completely un unnecessary. What's, uh, What's different now? And, and I, I'll tell you, I asked the question with, with some insight myself. I mean, it, so Kevin's brother is just legendary for black guys that arrived at Stanford when I did. I got there in the early 70s and, um, 
he may have been the first African American, um, one of the first dozen African Americans there, but, but the first scholarship athlete. And in terms of African American students, there have been African students, but not African American students in big numbers. So think about how different that time is um, compared to now. So just, just legendary in, in that sense. But you know, when, I, when we played, you about you know, 10 years uh, uh, later, later than me, there was time to do a lot of other stuff. And my son ended up playing tennis at Northwestern, graduated 2015. And I was just, I kind of got mad at him a little bit for telling me stuff he couldn't do. I just didn't understand the intensity of it all. And, and I wonder how you, both with your son and in the seat that you sit in now, how differently you look at college sports now from, from the way it was in the evolution you just talked about. Yeah, well, one of my big concerns right now is that for young people in general, and uh, not only college ath athletes, but a lot of young people that are here, you know, this world has become so busy and so complicated. And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, the advent of social media. And I just think when we grew up, I mean, Kim, we had four channels, there was no c cable television. And uh, we spent a lot of time, we played all sports. Uh, we didn't specialize. I see some young kids at eight years old you know, who I talk with about sports, what do they like? And they tell me, no, 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 they've already focused in on basketball. That's all they're going to play. And I think, uh, you know, now we've become so busy in our lives, we don't really take the time that we used to take, that we need to take to really build tangible, qualitative relationships, to be able to sit down, to break bread, to enjoy, to talk, to travel. Um, and so I always challenge everyone, you know, put the phones down. I mean, it's okay to, to, to communicate, but put the phones down. And so I, I have a rule, and I probably started it about a year ago, that when I'm in a meeting, uh, I turn my phone off, just like my phone is off. You know, when I'm at a dinner, I turn my phone off. Because those are the things that around the dinner table, whether it's family or friends or associates, that we've kind of lost that. So we're, we're multitask so much we never can really get and go deep on, on relationships. And so, Ken, that's one of the things that I'm really concerned about with all of the different things. Name, image, and likeness is wonderful. I'm glad that young people are blessed with an opportunity to monetize uh, their name, image, and likeness. But one of the concerns I have is that what is that you know, lead to? Uh, what is it? Are they overscheduled? And I look at my son's schedule from training to posting to school to academics. It just seems like he is always busy and does it morning, noon, and night, collapses and goes to sleep, and then does it all over again. And I just think back of, you know, what happened to the summer jobs? What happened to the summer internships? I mean, there's some of the things that helped me so much in college, you know, I work construction every summer in college. And not only did it help me physically, but it also helped me to recognize that that's like real adult work. And, uh, and, and I needed to make sure that I focus on school. And I uh, washed cars in the afternoon. I worked out after that. Then I worked security at concerts. And, you know, those are things that I did in college. And now I look back, very rarely do you see, especially student af athletes, having real tangible internships in the summer because they're so busy with training or going to summer school or an internship that maybe leads to help them to be a better athlete. And so I just, there's a lot of goodness that is, that's going on right now in college athletics. But one of the things that I want to make sure that we're doing at the Big Ten is to make sure that we provide a platform and an opportunity for our student athletes to really grow and learn and understand about life. July 14, 15, 16, we're taking 100 individuals from the Big Ten to Montgomery and Selma, Alabama, uh, to walk the Edmund Pettus Bridge, to go to some of the museums, to talk about many of these social justice issues, to report back. And we're planning a trip like that every single year. Next summer, we're going to go to the Holocaust Museum and the African American Museum of Natural uh, History. Uh, the summer of 24, uh, we're going to see the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, just to provide these opportunities so hopefully they walk away from school uh, with, with just more than being, uh, being a great athlete. And I don't want to be the, the two old guys sitting up here. We didn't, we didn't talk about this at all, but I had those same, almost exact same jobs, uh, loading freight on boxcars, uh, a steel bar warehouse in downtown L.A. 
Um, and, and then you go to early early ball. You know? But you, but you had a summer. You had some idea. I mean, the good thing was you said I don't want to do that. Right. I mean, the good thing was you had an opportunity to see what else was out there and what else life life could be. And I, I know I worried about my son not having those experiences, just just like you, you talked about. I mean, he's, he's kind of come out of it, going to law school, all these things have worked out fine, but it, it's a, a much dif different journey. So, so I do want to talk about um, how you got to the job mm -hmm. that you have now, and then talk some more about the state of, of college sports. And we, we never talked about this either. I think the first time we met um, that I recall was in the home of a, a, a college football player that was about to be drafted and we were, for lack of a better phrase, competing agents. Mm -hmm. A kid named uh, Dion Figures, if I recall correctly, in, in South Central LA. Yeah. And um, I, I remember you were going out as we were coming in. And I said, who is this brother? Because mm -hmm. it, it just weren't that many of us yeah. uh, trying to be in the business at that time. Um, it wasn't right for me. I ended up getting out of it, it pretty quickly. And then as I watched your career, you got out of it you know, relatively quickly, too. Why don't you talk about your journey to end up as, as a commissioner? And, and, and you know, the, the last panel, I think, was, was great. And I also think uh, uh, Steve White's panel yesterday talking about two things kind of fit with this. Everybody shouldn't want to be an agent. Let's, let's just put, put that out there. And getting to wherever you get is not a straight line. I mean, it's rare that it's a straight line, but, but why don't you talk about it some, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, and, and also speaking of Steve, I just want to thank Steve. I don't know if he's still here for what he's done and meant to this organization and ESPN and Jimmy Pataro, who's not only an incredible leader, but a great person, a man of integrity, and Brian Lockhart. And I was got an opportunity to see Kevin Dimoff backstage and just to congratulate Kevin and the Rams and what he did um, to be able to help move that franchise to Los Angeles, build SoFi Stadium, all of the real estate development. And you talking about dreams come true, the, the best thing to do, I was blessed to be on the Rams. We won the, the last Super Bowl, but to win it at home, we came one game short of that in Minnesota is unbelievable. But there's so many people involved uh, with this organization, which is fantastic. But, Ken, you're right. I mean, I think one of the things that I would hope that the young uh, people here today, all people here today, to recognize whatever you call success is not a straight path. Uh, we just did not get dropped into these seats today. It's been a long journey. Uh, it's been a lot of laughter some days. It's been a lot of great relationships. It's been a lot of tears. It's been disappointment. Uh, but I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona in 1963. Both of my parents were educators, uh, did not come from money. Education was critically important. And uh, my parents didn't play around. They were disciplined. My father was in World War II. And uh, my mom was incredibly disciplined. So you had to take care of academics first. And if you didn't do your homework, uh, if you smarted off to a teacher, smarted off to a referee, you know, my mom would pull you out for the whole season. And we didn't have time out in my house. You know, we got whip, but whip, uh, serious whippings. Um, and uh, she didn't fool around. And I'm grateful that my parents, you know, raised me in that manner. But uh, my life really changed. I'd say for the best at 11 and a half years old, I was run over by a car. Uh, should have died, uh, was incredibly, you know, blessed to live. And that's really when I understood the power of God and that angels do exist. My life was spared. But for the next year, I ended up spending a lot of time, more time than I ever wanted to, uh, in hospitals. And uh, I broke my femur, had a lot of other injuries, so I had a compound fracture, so had surgeries, had to go through um, that in a hospital. And then when I got out of the hospital, that's really when the fun began, because I got put in a full body cast, so all the way down to my toes on my right foot and three quarters of the way down on my left foot, a pole in between all the way up to my chest, hole in the front, hole in the back. I uh, had to go to the bathroom in a bedpan, and, uh, and again, back had four channels that I would lay in my bed. Uh, we didn't have cable, I didn't have Madden, I had books, uh, I had a lot of prayer, had a lot of tears, but that's really when I made my mind up that because the good Lord blessed me with a second act that I was gonna do all that I possibly can uh, once I got up and hopefully walked uh, walked again, um, got out of the body cast and 
probably at that time knew I would become a lawyer because I got a settlement and my doctor uh, who uh, did not have the best bedside manners. But one thing I would like to impart to you is that sometime even we got to get to the point in life where we really start to listen to what people are saying and not how they're saying it. And my doctor said the thing that would help me the most to recover would be to swim. And so I negotiated with my parents to use the majority of my settlement to build a swimming pool in our backyard. And so hence I've written a book called Build Your Own Pool, which will come out next year about just working through uh, the beautiful challenges in your life. So I worked through that journey. Uh, seven years later, was able to go on and play Division One basketball at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, transferred, and so that's one of the reasons why I'm okay with student athletes transferred because it worked for me. The coach who recruited me to the University of Pennsylvania as a 17-year-old high school player one year later went back to Arizona State, and uh, and he was one of the main reasons why I went to Penn. But I transferred from Penn, ended up having a wonderful career, Grand Canyon University, stayed healthy, played well, went into their Hall of Fame. Uh, got my MBA at Arizona State, had an older sister who became seriously ill, and she took care of me when I was in my accident. She was living in South Bend, Indiana at the time, so I went and lived in her basement, cared for her and her two young kids while I went to law school at Notre Dame, and ironically, both of those young kids who were three and five at the time are both lawyers now, so something may have uh, worn off. And as Ken alluded to, I was scheduled to go back and work for the largest law firm in Phoenix, had accepted a job, um, and that's why you got to spend time you know, with people, because I got a call from a law firm, one of the lawyers that I had decided not to go work for. And that was interesting, because so many times, you know, we never know where our blessings come from. But I got a call from him, and he said, there's a gentleman in Chicago named Mike Slive that you should go have lunch with, because I know you want to get into sports, because I was going back to be a litigator in Phoenix. And I called Mike Slive, drove my small Toyota Corolla with 100,000 miles on it up from South Bend to Chicago, uh, had breakfast with him. And by the time I got back to my apartment in South Bend, uh, he left a message on my answer machine offering me a job as an associate. And Mike Slive had the largest law firm of uh, doing investigations into college athletics. So I went and worked for Slive and Glazier um, for a couple years. And as Ken alluded to, then I started a sports agency and uh, did very well for five years. And I tell people all the time, until you've had to meet payroll and, and uh, have employees, um, you really get a chance to understand business. But had was blessed with great clients, Chris Zorch on the Bears, and Will Shields, who went to Nebraska, who's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Lake Dawson, uh, who played for the Chiefs, who's now works in, in the NFL. But I did that for five years. And then, again, another angel. I got introduced uh, to a man named Dick Vermeil who was coming out of retirement to go be the coach of the St. Louis Rams. They were losing his franchise in the 90s, and I ended up getting out of my sports agency business, went and worked at the Rams in player development, and three years later, with the greatest show on turf, uh, we were able to, to win the Super Bowl. Ironically, here in Atlanta, uh, in the, the old stadium, we beat the Tennessee Titans here, so it's always special when I come to Atlanta. And that Super Bowl, championship, my life changed forever. And I was able to stay at the Rams one more uh, uh, year, got a big promotion to go to the Lions, was there for two years, went back and worked at the firm that I'd interned with. And, uh, and then another opportunity came up, and that was for me to lead the group to buy the Minnesota Vikings. So I worked on that for a year. We ended up closing on the deal. I moved to Minnesota in 2005. I told our ownership group that I would stay there for a year uh, to help them transition. I ended up being there for 16 seasons. And we, done, we did a lot of great stuff together. We built a new stadium, U.S. Bank Stadium, a new practice uh, facility, Twin Cities Orthopedic Performance Center. Got a chance to help hire a lot of young people of color, women. Uh, many of them are here today. And uh, had my head down, had a wonderful career in the NFL. And then I got a call again from another angel who I had set on a committee with, uh, a search committee with, and he asked me if I would be interested in talking with them about uh, the Big Ten Conference and being a commissioner uh, at the Big Ten Conference. I went and had a couple meetings with the board, and, and, they, uh, and uh, June 2nd of 2019, they ended up offering uh, me the job. I accepted it, started in September. And uh, as a transition, formally started on January 2nd of 20, and then COVID hit in March of 20, 
and we went through two years of living hell, um, um, working our way through it. But there's so much and so many good lessons you can learn in hell. Uh, so as now we're coming out on the back end. We got a great team of people together. We've been blessed now to be working on some of our, our media deals. We have a data analytics department that we've uh, started. We've been able to grow our, our diversity from 13% to over 33% in really two and a half uh, uh, years. And um, so the future is bright. I count my blessings every single day. I spend multiple times a day on my hands and knees just thanking God for this opportunity. And I want to do all that I can while, while that I have breath. So it's a blessing to, to be here today, Ken. Yeah, that, that's something else. The 30 years goes by. And the thing I'm probably most proud of, I just celebrated my 30th wedding anniversary uh, with the same person. Uh, uh, that's always critical. You don't, you don't a lot of people have 30 years, but they do it with three or four different people, but with the same person uh, uh, who's an incredibly strong black woman uh, who's been supportive. We've been blessed with two healthy kids. Our son, as I said, Powers, he graduated from Mississippi State, played football, did a grad transfer to Michigan State, so he has one more year uh, to play. Um, at Michigan State. Uh, he's only six hours away from his master's in kinesiology, so we had a couple rules when he went to college. You know, go and save all of his scholarship money, uh, go and come home with at least one and hopefully two degrees, and don't come home with any other additions to the family. So that was the rule uh, for him. And then our daughter, Perry, uh, who was a student athlete at Occidental College in L.A., graduated, and she just finished her master's uh, uh, here last week at Northwestern. And uh, so she's kind of going off into the world, too. So I'm just, uh, like I said, I'm just truly uh, grateful, humbled, and honored that we get a chance to do things that our parents and grandparents, I would say, couldn't even, you know, dream about. And that's one of the things in this industry we got to recognize that we stand on the shoulders of so many people who sacrifice. And uh, we got to recognize that each and every day, that it truly is a blessing. And we need to make sure we, as a people, uh, as an industry, that we don't do anything to, to lose sight of how many people worked hard uh, to get us to where we are. And like I said, um, my grandmother's from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, was a maid in Phoenix, Arizona, went to second grade education. Now, she's a certified genius, uh, could do math in her head but never had a driver's license, never flew on a plane, never drove a car, never owned a house because she lived in the projects, but she was uh, never late for a cleaning appointment and uh, just very responsible. So again, every single day, I think about big mama and grandma, and my parents and all these people who, you know, sacrifice, really who put quarters, you know, in a can for us to go to college. Um, and I, that's why I'm just so humbled and honored. And I just want to challenge you all, you know, here every single day. Don't forget from where you came from and don't forget from where your ancestors came from and how hard it is for us to get here today and make sure that we leave the world a better place than when we received it. Thank you. You, you know, I was going to say, Kevin, that, you know, it, it's a lot in, in 30 years. And, and I will tell you, it, it goes by much quicker than you than you imagine and the idea that he got stuck at minnesota for 16 years that's not uncommon either whatever your plan is it's not your plan it, it's it's a, allow those moments to happen and sometimes those, i was going to be in philadelphia for two years and it ended up in there for 35 years and you just don't know where the opportunity is going to be the, the other thing and and the, one of the values that that uh, uh, Kevin knows I appreciate is we, we let's say we're rarely kind of competing in the same space, but it was always somebody to call to bounce something off of that's yeah. been on a journey for the same period. So you're meeting folks today that will be part of your life going forward. Mm -hmm. And the more you don't look at it as competition, you look at it, let's, let's lift each other through this process. Mm -hmm. the, the last piece I'll add, add, add to that, then, then I, want, I do want to talk about some, some college sports specific stuff, and then we're going to open up for some questions. Um, the, 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 the last piece that, that I, I want to add is, is just the importance of uh, allowing it to happen in, in the way that it happens, that, that, that whole journey piece, allowing the journey and enjoying the journey. 
in, enjoying it as, as it happens and, and don't have the frustration when it doesn't happen in the direction that you, you want it to go. Yeah, and I always tell people all the time, be where your feet are. Because so many people that I meet, young and old, come to me about what they can do to get their next job. And the first thing that I ask them is that, have you mastered your current job? Um, and I just learned if you master your current opportunities, you'll, ha you'll have so many <laughs> opportunities. You'll have too many necks. And you'll be blessed uh, where you are. So just kind of be where you f feed are, back to social media. Stay off of that, you know, because a lot of those pictures that you see, our people are looking on social media, they don't look that way. And, um, and their ca careers <laughs> aren't really that good. So just focus on being the best you can be and be where your, your feet are. I have a chapter in, in my book uh, called Let It Bake. And where it came from, when I was about 14 years old, I've always loved to cook. I wanted to, to cook. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I, was, I had a little money in my pocket, especially after the accident. My mom took me grocery shopping and I wanted to do some barbecue chicken. Mm. And so my mom said to really, before you put it on the grill, uh, you should bake it in the oven for a little bit. You know, let it bake a little bit and put it on the grill. But I was an expert at 14, although my mom had been cooking for almost 50 years then. I'm like, well, what does she know about that? You know, I know how to work a grill. So I got the grill going, had the fire way too hot. She came out there and said, you got the flame too hot. And I looked at her and said, like, who are you? I'm 14. I can cook. <laughs> and uh, so I put that barbecue chicken on a hot fire flame. And, you know, it was getting crusty. It, it looked great. And as I call it, the head fake, so many things look great, but they aren't great. It looked great. And I made my little baked beans and potato salad and all those different things and sat down, blessed the food, and I bit into that chicken, and the blood was coming out, and it was, it was still cold. And I, so I talk about, in life, there's some things you got to let it bake. And what she was saying to me, let it bake in the oven, get a little uh, more cooked, and then when you put it on the grill, you'll get to where you want to come through. So don't put the pressure on yourself to just run to the front all the way. Sometimes things just take time. And so now as I look back, one of the greatest blessings in my life was to be able to spend 16 years in Minnesota. One, how many times in the NFL are you in one place that long and I could raise my kids? My kids went there in first, my son was in first grade, my daughter was in third grade. And when we left Minnesota, uh, my daughter was graduated from college in grad school and my son was three quarters of the way through college. That just doesn't happen. And plus it allowed me to hone my skills, to build a stadium, to do naming rights deal, to sell suites, to buy real estate, to build apartments and, and uh, uh, build a practice facility. And there's 19 Fortune 500 CEOs in Minnesota. I got a chance to develop those relationships with them. I got a chance to let it bake. And so, so many times, spend the time of where you're supposed to be because God has you where you're supposed to be for the reason. So be where your feet are, build those relationships. Don't try to predict who's going to be the CEO one day. Just be a good person because I can't tell you the number of interns that I've met that I've hired that are now general counsels or CEOs across the country. So just be good to everyone. Be there to try to help as many people as you possibly can and realize what I do every single day, that the 1440, there's 1,440 minutes in a day. That's all we have. So try to be judicious with that time, leave a better legacy uh, than when you got it. And your career, you'll always end up better than you thought you would. And like Ken said, the thing I have learned as I sit here today, 30 years is really a vapor. It goes so very fast. So combination question, Kevin, just to get, get the college sports piece, transfer portal, NIL, uh, paying athletes, what, what's, 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 the, what's the future? What, what's what's going to be good? How are those things going to fit in? What else will we see as we go forward? I think all of it. I mean, uh, you know, transfer portal, uh, I believe, again, I'm a product of it. Student athletes should have an opportunity to transfer. Young people make decisions sometime for things based upon things they shouldn't be making decisions on. Coaches leave. Uh, things change. And so I think people should have an opportunity. My big concern, one, because of my family being in, in uh, um, educators, is the fact, whether it's transfer portal, whether it's name, image, and likeness, 
uh, whether it's um, you know student athletes being compensated for their services. I always go back to the purpose of why we're there in college, and that is to get an education. Um, because even if you look at a person like Steph Curry, who's had a brilliant career, uh, top, top, Hall of Famer for sure, he's still only 34 years old. So let's say he plays six more years. LeBron's 37. Uh, so let's say at age 39 or 40, that's still incredibly young. And I don't care what your financial statement looks like. You can't lay around the house all day. You got to do something. And, and, and I'm not saying college is the only way to learn how to do something, but if you're in college, my big concern, whether it's the transfer portal, name, image, and likeness, is that we need to make sure that our young student athletes, men and women, women have an opportunity to get a qualitative education while they're there. That's number one. And if you can transfer, like I did, and still move forward, great. But if you transfer and you lose 28 credits, uh, I got a problem with that. And the same thing with from an NIL standpoint. I just want to make sure that our student athletes who are earning NIL money, that one, is not stressing them out. Two, they're not competing and see where they're ranked on the leaderboard. But three, that they can focus on their education and that the only thing worse than not achieving something is to achieve it and then to lose it is the fact that what happens from a tax standpoint, what happens from a family pressure standpoint, what happens if they finish their education and do not play professionally, uh, what happens with that NIL money. Though we've got some student athletes right now in college that are earning a very good sum of money who will not play professionally and who will earn less money when they're done with college than they're earning right now. And so just emotionally and mentally, how do they sync that up? How do they operate that? So I'm, I'm all about all the stuff is good so long as it's in moderation, but we need to make sure that they still are moving toward a meaningful degree, not a piece of paper, but a degree where they can go into the world and compete with many of you here and to be able to sit on this stage one day. Okay, two, two final questions, then we want to open, it, open up the audience to ask whatever you want to ask. Uh, the first advice to your 20-year-old self, that's the best advice. You've given a lot, but the, the, the key bullet points you want to leave behind uh, to especially the young folks here. I think the best advice I would give to myself is uh, um, just lose all anxiety, really, because things have a, have a way of... Of, of working themselves out for a reason. You know, you look the way you look. Uh, you were raised the way you were raised by who you were raised with. You were provided the opportunities. And I would just say, take advantage of those. You know, I'm now that I'm getting older, you and I are getting older, I'm very conscious of, of making sure I'm doing everything I can physically, mentally, career-wise to slow the clock down. And when you're younger, what you're trying to do is speed everything up. You know, you can't, if you're in fourth grade, you can't wait to get to fifth grade. If you're in fifth, you can't wait to go to junior high. If you're in high school, you can't wait to go to college. And college, you're ready to go to work. And, you know, so you spend the first 30, 40 years of your life trying to speed everything up. And then once you recognize how beautiful life is, and then it seems like kind of around age 50 for me is when I really have focused on trying to slow things down. And that old adage that our parents have told us, um, our parents have, have really given us the roadmap. So when they would say, take time to smell the roses, I really didn't know what that meant. And what that meant is really is that, um, Take time to do it. And D'Amica knows this, and Monterey, other people who work with me, I get fresh flowers delivered to my office every week. Like, I love flowers. I have always loved flowers. And I can't tell you the number of times during the day that I get up from my desk and just smell the flowers to take time to do it. Because we're so busy in a rush, you know, to get to that house that we think is special or that car or cars or that summer home or third home or go on that trip, it's going to be there. But just kind of there's so much kind of beauty in the struggle. Soak it all in. Uh, that, that's the advice that I would give to myself because now that we're here and everything that I dreamt about we've accomplished and more. Um, and then all those things become, they really become 
you know, irrelevant. I don't, I don't, my kids tease me. If I never had to drive another day in my life, I'd be happy. And so all these cars I thought that I want that I got now, it's like, I don't even drive them. So, you know, that's how, that's kind of how life is. So just slow down, enjoy the journey, soak up life. It goes fast, build relationships and, um, just really in, in, enjoy in, enjoy your blessing because it can change in a moment. And my final question, and then then we'll open it up. Is you mentioned the, the kind of the Mount Rushmore in sports? For us, the the, the, the final two big seats that exist, um, especially in the NFL, is majority ownership of a franchise mm -hmm. and the commissioner job, and. Um, you know, we, we, we don't talk about this off, offline much. We've talked about the ownership stuff for sure. But, but the, the idea of, of what can we aspire to, what is it that we need to do next? There's important stuff with, with college athletes and making sure we get what we're supposed to get. But in terms of uh, positions and stations in this business, those, those are the two biggest ones. And I know, you know, if I'm Roger Goodell, I'm, I'm going to try to continue being commissioner from the grave and get 30, 40, 50 million dollars a year. Um, but but the day is the day is going to come, and and I'm not you know, and Kevin's always on the list of people uh, that may be in position to, to look at that job at, at some point. How important is that, and, and what can you convey about you know, as, you, as they're on their journeys? How important is it to, to strive for those two, which has been a big part of our lives? And you, you've had some success with the ownership piece, but that other job is, is still the. Uh, you know, still kind of a brass ring of sorts. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, Ken, is to be where you are. I mean, as I sit here today, I mean, I was I was grinding away on the Peloton this morning, and I was thinking uh, in my hotel, I was thinking, you know, what more can I do to help kind of change the world because of where I am right now? And when I think about it, you think about the Big Ten, started in 1895, not many years um, after slavery. 1866. Especially with, 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 with Juneteenth. Um, here this weekend. So when you think about that, since 1865, when the Big Ten started, we've only had five commissioners. So I'm the sixth commissioner since 1895. There are many days that I go down to the conference room and look, and I see those faces. They don't look like me. But in the A5, in the Power Five, there's been one black person on planet Earth who's been a commissioner. And it's me. I don't take myself too seriously. I'm a normal person. I have probably average intelligence. If I took an IQ test, it would be average. Now, there's some people in my family who are off the scale. Um, I have an incredible work ethic uh, from that standpoint. I just stay determined. You know, that old adage of a dog on a bone, that's what I am. Uh, I am not going to quit. I'm one of those people, if I was on a boat and it capsized, I would eat wood for a month, but I'm going to survive. When they show up, I may have a beard and, you know, teeth fall out or whatever, but I'm going to be living. I'm just one of those, you know, individuals that from a mentally tough standpoint, I'm going to just stay the course. So I don't even look over the horizon what's next. I want to be and be the best possible commissioner that I possibly can. But I ask myself every day, what can I do to help more people of color become Power Five commissioners? What can I do to help be involved, to help a, a woman to be able to be a Power Five commissioner? We've had all, all white men uh, at this level and one black male. And so I say that just to make sure that we just don't take the elevator to the penthouse and then there are a lot of people take the elevator to the penthouse and then pull the red button out so you can't even use it. I'm all about how we can make sure that we can send it back down to the floor, uh, bring as many people up. So where I am right now, that's my focus. I'm blessed. Uh, I am so grateful. Constantly, just so grateful. I'm going to do everything I possibly can if I'm at the Big Ten for one more day or for ten more years. And then whatever happens next, happens next. But I just want to make sure as many people as I can out here that I help uh, as, as, as we possibly can. And I would challenge you all to do it. One thing I would challenge uh, you to do is pick one person, you know, in your life who's, who's really helped you to get here today. Maybe you haven't talked with in a while. Um, and whether it's a text message, a letter this week, or a phone call, pick up the pick pick whatever device up you use and just to tell them thank you for what they've done because we need to remember 
that this is a tough journey, and I'm a big believer. If you leave more on the table than you take away, that your life uh, will be incredibly blessed. So, Ken, I'm, I'm just honored to be the Big Ten commissioner today, and that's all it is. I'm on a, I am on a one-day contract. That's the way I look at it. And so today, I'll do my job, and then hopefully I have an opportunity to do it tomorrow and kind of let the chips fall where they may. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's open it up. next for DEI from the 